Hello, and welcome to Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. If you ask me, there are two kinds of cops in America. I wouldn't say they fall completely in line with one kind or the other, but if we're speaking in general terms, I see them as two groups. There are people who become cops because they genuinely want to do good. These people often have family members in law enforcement, and they grow up with a healthy respect for the position. They want to help. They know it's a good job with good benefits, and hey, it comes with some modicum of authority and respect, right? I think most people who become cops, maybe military, politicians, are attracted to the aspect of respect that comes with the job. Then you have the other group of cops. I like to believe this group is much, much smaller than the first group, but I know there are people who disagree with me. This group of cops is made up of people who have small man syndrome, whether they're men or women. They're small people mentally and emotionally, and they're attracted to the police force because they want power over others. They're attracted to the badge, to the authority, and to the fact that even though they've never commanded respect in life for who they are, they can command respect if they become a cop. These are the bad cops. I've had run-ins with two bad cops in my lifetime, and they were both just the smallest of men I have ever come into contact with. They are so easily intimidated, especially by a woman with a quick wit and a big mouth, that their only defense is to become abusive and loud and threatening. I've had encounters with plenty of good cops as well, and they never had any problem with me at all. I never had any problem with them. But the bad cops, we can spot them a mile away. In that small portion of bad cops, there is an even smaller faction of a different breed of cops the criminal cops. As we have discussed here on Dining with Death many times, it is extremely common for serial killers to be attracted to law enforcement. It is so common that there are websites devoted to the pages and pages of murderers who either applied to become police officers, were police officers, or were rejected from the police force only to go into security or some kind of police adjacent field. The type of man we're talking about today is a criminal cop. This man loved the uniform. He loved the power and he loved the badge. But karma misses very infrequently. And little did he know, it would literally be the badge he loved so much that would land him in prison for murder. This is the story of the murder of Kara Knott, the story of the killer cop. Let's get into it. December 27, 1986. Our story begins in El Cajon, California. 20-year-old Kara Knott was a college student studying at San Diego State University. She ran track and she loved the outdoors and she was studying to become a teacher. Over the Christmas break, her longtime boyfriend, Wayne Batista, fell ill, and Kara told her parents that she was going to drive to Wayne's house in Escondido to take him some soup and to take care of him while he was sick. Kara called her mother and asked her how to use a thermometer and for other advice on caring for someone who was ailing. Kara spent the day with Wayne at his house, and then she called her father, Sam, around 8 o'clock that night and told him she was finishing up and getting ready to leave Wayne's house. Kara then left to return to her parents' house in El Cajon. As the evening wore on, her parents were surprised when Kara didn't show up. It got later and later, and around 10 o'clock, Kara's father sat straight up in his chair and suddenly said to his wife, I'm going to look for Kara. Kara's mother was surprised and asked why Kara's father told her he was going, and he said he had a bad feeling. Kara's father drove around as her mother sat and worried through the night. In the early morning hours, the Knots called the police and reported their daughter missing. The police began to search for Kara, and the search did not take them long. Officers were searching along I-15, where Kara would have been traveling. There is a stretch of road that is somewhat notorious for crimes and for things that people want to hide away. It's here under this freeway bridge. The police in the area actually call this area the tomb because from below it looks and feels as though you're in a large crypt. One police officer told the press that whenever he was called to this area, he spent as little time as possible there because it had such a creepy feel to it. As the police began to search the area, they saw it. As you can see in these photos from back in 1986, 
Kara's ivory-colored Volkswagen bug is sitting under the bridge. The door was open and all of Kara's things were inside the car. As more officers arrived at the location, they began to cordon off the area. This was very, very bad news and they all knew it. The forensics unit took photos and the police began to search the surrounding area. Before long, they found her. Not far from her car was the body of Kara Knott. There were ligature marks very clearly around her throat and the detail in those marks showed she had clearly been strangled with a piece of rope. There was also a large bruise above one of Kara's eyes where she had been struck by something round. Other injuries showed that she had been thrown off of the bridge from above down to the area where her car was found. Kara's family rushed to the scene when they heard her car had been located. Kara's father walked up to one of the officers guarding the scene and said, Tell me man to man, did you find my daughter? The officer said, yes, I'm sorry. Kara's father replied, I wish you could have known her. She was an angel. Ugh. It's truly heartbreaking and his response kind of tells me he knew, right? Sometimes we have this sixth sense that we can't really explain. It was like he knew she was gone before he knew. Everyone from Kara's family to the police were confused. Why would Kara have left the freeway late in the evening to come down to this completely isolated area under a bridge? There would have been absolutely no reason for her to do that. At autopsy, the coroner confirmed Kara's cause of death was strangulation. There was no evidence of sexual assault. Inside Kara's car, police found the receipt from a nearby gas station, a station that was about 15 miles from where Kara was murdered. Police went to that gas station and talked to the employees that were working the night Kara came in. They said the transaction was completely normal, usual. Kara stopped at the pump, put gas in her car, came in and paid, and left. There was nothing strange or suspicious about her behavior at all. Back at the crime scene, investigators found two very distinctive skid marks left by a larger vehicle. They were fresh and they were right near the crime scene. So officers set up tents around the marks in order to preserve them and then they began to photograph them. As you can see here, the distance between the two tire marks was exactly 53 inches. There was also a clear and distinct pattern from the tires left in the marks. Police then began to theorize that someone had pulled up next to Kara and using some excuse, coerced her into leaving the freeway and driving down under the bridge. Police knew this would have to be someone Kara trusted and they immediately became suspicious of Kara's boyfriend. Who else knew right where Kara was going to be? Who else would she trust enough to follow off the freeway to a dark and unsafe location? Police interviewed Wayne Batista, Karen's boyfriend. Not only was he at home sick, his sister verified that Wayne had been home all night long. He hadn't left. Both siblings told police that Kara left the Batista home just after eight o'clock and they didn't see her again. The police were baffled. They asked a local news station to feature Kara's murder on an episode of the area Crime Stopper segments. Here you can see that story being filmed. It helped to get the word out about the murder, but sadly, even after it aired, no one came forward stating that they had seen or heard anything that might help. The producers of the Crime Stoppers segment even filmed a reenactment of Kara at the gas station in the same clothes and car she would have been driving, hoping that the images might jog someone's memory, might help them to recall anything they might have seen. Still, no one came forward. Because the public was very concerned about this murder, the news stations got involved and started producing segments on driver safety. They were concerned that there might be someone on their freeways taking women to the side and killing them. They thought these news segments on driver safety might help. One of the local stations enlisted the help of someone with a lot of experience on the freeways, Highway Patrol Officer Craig Pyre. Here you can see him in one of those productions, giving instructions about what to do if someone tries to force you off the road. He talks about how women should be extremely cautious if they are on the side of the road. And he even gave instructions on what to do if someone tried to get into their vehicle or tried to take them into their vehicle. Officer Pyre is helpful and well-spoken and the news segments ended up airing over the course of several weeks. As the segments air, the police begin to receive some very surprising and disturbing phone calls via the Crime Stoppers hotline. They received more than 30 calls coming from women 
claiming they had been stopped on that exact section of road and told to pull off the freeway and down underneath the bridge where Kara's body was found. They weren't exactly calling because of Kara's murder or the location. They were calling because they had seen Officer Craig Pyre in those news segments teaching driver safety. Why? Because Officer Craig Pyre had been the one who had pulled them over and taken them under the bridge. He was the same officer that had been featured in the safety videos produced by the news stations. Not only had Officer Pyer pulled the women over, he had made sexual advances towards them. Many of the women reported he got into the vehicle with them, and sometimes he would even grope them. Craig Pyer would flip on his police lights, pull the women over, and then instruct them to follow him down under the overpass. Once they were there, the situation turned dark quickly. Now, I want to stop here for just a moment. If this is not proof of how serious a problem we have with women fearing that they will not be believed when they report sexual assault, I don't know what is. We've got 30 women, 3-0, that have experienced a cop pulling them over, taking them to an isolated location, making them uncomfortable, and even making sexual advances towards them, and not one of them had come forward and reported it until someone was killed. Why? Do all 30 of these women have mental telepathy and were in each other's heads concocting these stories about Craig Pyre? I mean, honestly, some of the idiotic things people believe now, they might believe that. But the real reason is that women are afraid that no one will believe them. The estimates are that only one in 10 to 14 women who are sexually assaulted comes forward. Have you seen what happens to them when they do? especially if it's years later, they are destroyed in the media. And then of course you have the worst people in the world, the women who make up stories and then make it all the more difficult for women who have actually been assaulted to be believed. But the point I want to drive home is that most of the time when women are assaulted, the fear of not being believed is enough to keep them quiet. And until we start believing victims first and asking questions second, that's not going to change. We can't let the very small percentage of liars color our view on this. Most women are terrified of coming forward, and for me, there is no better proof of that than this story. I'd also like to rant and rave about Craig Pyer's arrogance, how he thought he could do this to women and then go on the news, and no one would say anything. But I guess I'll leave that rant to another day. December 30th, 1986. Police immediately begin looking into Officer Craig Pyre. They find that he is one of those officers. His whole life is being a cop. It is his entire personality, his entire identity. The boots were always shined. The uniform was always perfectly pressed. Nothing wrong with either of those things. And Craig was known as a strict by the book officer, although he was what other officers call a hot pencil. He gave an extraordinarily high number of speeding tickets and citations compared to other officers. Personally, that's a red flag in itself and something I wish departments would look into a little more. My ex-father-in-law was a highway patrolman here in Utah for decades, a sergeant leader at that. I'll have to save some of those stories for another day, but I heard him talk about officers who were hot pencils. And yes, there is a type of officer that's known to like to give tickets. Craig Pyre was one of those. Investigators pulled Craig Pyre's logbook. Back then, of course, there were no computers. The cops kept handwritten logs of everything they did. Pyre's logbook showed that he was miles away from the scene of the murder at the time the police believed Kara would be murdered in that location. You can see here, he was writing a ticket around 9.30. Other officers said they highly doubted that Craig Pyre was involved, but that they knew they still had to look into him. And luckily, that's just what they did. They bring Craig Pyre in for questioning and they immediately notice something very telling. He has scratches on his hands and he has scratches on his neck. Craig Pyre tells investigators that he fell against a fence near the police station getting out of his car. They asked exactly where and Craig Pyre took them to the parking lot of the police barracks. Well, investigators knew that location well, and as they looked around, they were confused. The fence was up several feet higher than the level of the blacktop. In order for the top of the fence to touch Craig Pyre and scratch him, he would have had to take like a running jump at it. This wasn't adding up, something was wrong. 
Then the officers looking over Pyre's logbook pointed out this glaring detail. Whatever Craig Pyre had originally written in his logbook at about 9.30, the time they believed Kara was murdered, had been erased. It wasn't even erased well. Craig Pyre had altered his logbook, something the police are not supposed to do. Still, the police were hesitant to believe that one of their own could be involved, but they continued to investigate. They asked Officer Pyre to turn over the uniform and the boots he had been wearing the night Carol was killed, and Pyre willingly handed them over. The items were taken to the forensics lab and the investigation on them began. At the initial examination, under a microscope, technicians could see that there were several different fibers attached to the badge of Officer Pyre's uniform, the embroidered patch that serves as the officer's badge while in the field. Under the microscope, it was found that the thread that patch was made of was sewn with very unusual fibers. I got this information off of an old episode of Forensic Files. Apparently, most thread is colored with dye. That is the newer technique. But before dyes were as good as they are today, thread, and especially gold thread, was colored with pigment, which I'm assuming would be some type of powder. These gold threads used to embroider the patch on Officer Pyre's uniform were colored with pigment, and that made them very unusual. The fiber expert said he had only seen one other case where fibers, threads, were colored with pigment instead of dye. There was no mistaking the fibers under a microscope because they were so unusual. As the lab technicians gather their evidence and begin to discuss the unusual fibers, one of the technicians that was assigned to look at Kara Knott's clothing, the clothing she was wearing at the time of her murder, said, I've seen that fiber before. So you've got one guy over here looking at the patch on Pyre's uniform. You've got another technician looking at the clothes. The officer looking at the patch happened to come in and look at the fibers found on Kara's clothing. He obviously sees this unusual fiber, this single gold pigment-colored fiber was found on Kara Knott's sweatshirt. The technicians placed the two fibers side by side and they were identical. Kara Knott had a fiber on her clothing that came from the patch of Officer Craig Pyer's uniform. Before investigators accused one of their own of murder, they went even further to solidify their evidence. They sent both fibers, the one found on Kara's sweatshirt and some fibers taken from Pyer's patch, to a forensic microscopist. One of the technicians said later on they were convinced the fibers were the same, but because they were accusing a cop, they wanted to get into the makeup of each fiber. I think it would be nice if they did that on every case, right? The forensic microscopist put a very small clipping from each fiber in a liquid that separates the fiber from the pigment in order to get a reading from a spectrophotometer. This device sends light through the pigment to see how much light passes through each granule of the pigment. As the spectrophotometer measures the light, it builds a little graph of the readings. When the two graphs were compared, the fiber from Kara's clothing and the fiber from the officer's badge, again, identical. Isn't that cool? This is the kind of science we need to rely on. Not polygraphs, not voice stress analyzation. We need to rely on actual science because it is so much more solid. You guys know I find this kind of stuff fascinating and I know a lot of you do as well. I think it is really, really interesting. It's something that I would never be able to study because my brain just doesn't work that way. I do not have a science brain, but I like hearing about it and I, I'm very happy that there are people that have those kinds of brains that function on a different level than mine because, I mean, they're solving crimes every day. The investigators even asked the forensic microscopist to test fibers from other highway patrol patches to see if they were the same as Pyre's patch. None of the fibers from other patches matched what was on Officer Pyre's patch. For whatever reason, the maker of that particular patch grabbed that different thread on the day it was manufactured, and there was no disputing those fibers were on Kara Knott. It kind of feels like serendipity, doesn't it? That such a tragic event could have such a solid forensic clue. And I also find it very ironic that the badge Craig Pyre loved so much became his literal undoing when he misused that power, right? There's something very poetic about the fact that he was abusing the power that comes with the badge, and the badge is the thing that got him caught. As if this wasn't enough evidence, police also tested Craig Pyer's boots and they tested his gun. 
On both items, they found purplish maroon fibers. Those fibers were tested with the same method, with a spectrophotometer, and again, they were found to be an exact match to the purple sweatpants Kara was wearing when she was murdered. So they had Officer Pyre's fibers on Kara and Kara's fibers on Officer Pyre. Investigators then went through Craig Pyre's patrol car. They sprayed luminol in the trunk and the interior, but found nothing. They didn't really expect to. Officer Pyre was trained. With enough forensics information, he would be aware of the techniques police would use to try and catch him. They didn't find anything with the luminol, but they did find something else in Pyre's trunk. As you can see in this photo, under the spare tire, there is a length of rope. They took the rope to a forensic specialist who has extensive experience with rope. He measured the ligature marks on Kara's neck at 7 sixteenths of an inch. The pattern on Kara's neck and the distance of the coiling matched the rope in Craig Pyre's car perfectly. The scientist couldn't say for certain that it was that exact rope, but he could say it was most likely that rope that caused the ligature marks on Kara's neck. Then investigators found a tiny drop of blood on Kara Knott's shoe. There was no DNA testing back in 1986. The best thing they could do was blood typing. Again, this just feels serendipitous because the blood on Kara's shoe was type AB, the most rare form of blood in America. Who has type AB blood? Officer Craig Pyre. Not only did he have a very rare fiber used to sew only his patch, he had the rarest type of blood one can have. It feels like he was really lined up to fall, and I love that. Craig Pyre might have gotten away with his aberrant behavior before many times, but his luck had run out, and now it was time for him to face what he had done. January 17th, 1987. 21 days after Kara Knott's murder, Officer Craig Pyre was arrested and taken into custody, charged with her murder. He was a 13-year veteran of the California Highway Patrol, and he was now facing a first-degree murder charge. In the only interview he gave, he shocked investigators by saying, I'm not saying I did this, but if I did, what would happen to me? He seemed to imply that he believed, because he was a cop, he was expecting some type of different treatment than anyone else would face under the same circumstances. And this angered many of the investigators. I saw an interview with some of the cops and they said they were embarrassed to be wearing the same uniform as Pyre had worn and they were ready to throw the book at him. The public was shocked to learn that an officer had been charged with this cold and brutal murder. Prosecutors began to build a case against Pyre, and they had plenty of evidence. They had the fiber evidence, they had the blood evidence, they had the rope evidence, and that wasn't all. They brought in a tire expert who stated that the skid marks left at the crime scene, the ones that were 53 inches apart, perfectly matched the tire spread of Craig Pyre's patrol car. The size and the shape of the bruise on Kara's face matched perfectly with the bell of a police flashlight. They theorized that Craig Pyre first saw Kara Knott filling her car with gas at the Chevron station. They believe Officer Pyre followed Kara along the highway until he arrived at his favorite pullover location by the isolated bridge. He then flipped on his lights and pulled Kara to the side of the road. The prosecutors brought in some of the other women who claimed to have been attacked by Officer Pyre. They said Officer Pyre would turn on his lights, pull them over, and then use his loudspeaker to direct them off the freeway and down under the bridge off the next exit. Kara most likely did as she was told and followed instructions. Prosecutors theorized that once Pyre had Kara alone in the deserted and dark location, he tried to get into her car like he had done with the other victims. Kara most likely fought back. They believe the officer then ordered Kara out of her car and a fight ensued during which Kara scratched the officer's arm and face. They believe he then took his flashlight and with a backhanded motion struck Kara hard above her eye, knocking her unconscious. Realizing he had gone much too far this time, he decided to get rid of the witness. Officer Pyre grabbed the rope from the trunk of his car and strangled Kara to death with it. Investigators believe the officer then put Kara on the hood of his car so she would not transfer hair or fiber into his vehicle, and he drove her up the ramp and onto the bridge where he tossed her over. 
They think he tossed her over to cause more damage to the body. They believe that when he picked her up, either to place her on the hood of his car or to dump her body, the transfer of fiber and blood took place. That single fiber survived the 70 foot fall to the bottom. Craig Pyer was found guilty and was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. I pulled his prison records and found out that he came up for parole for the first time in 2004. He was denied for four years. He came up for parole again in 2008. Again, he was denied for four years. In 2012, he came up for parole and he was denied for 15 years. He doesn't have a record of bad behavior in prison. So this must reflect the changing attitudes of our time, that police officers should be held not only to the law, but to a higher standard of the law. They have the ultimate power, and with that power comes more responsibility. To be honest with you, I took some joy in seeing that he was denied for so long. You know he thought he was getting out, right? And you know that had to be such a huge blow to find out he had another 15 years. And I just love that for him. He comes up for parole again in 2027. He will be 77 years old then. He's 73 now. I certainly hope that they don't let this monster out at all. There is nothing worse or more dangerous than a bad cop, and he is right where he belongs. Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. Hit the like button if you like the video, subscribe to my channel if you want to see more from me, and if you really want to support me, you can join my Patreon. That is kind of what's keeping the channel afloat right now, and our ultimate goal there is to raise money for police departments that have cold case DNA in storage that cannot be tested because there's no money to test it. We want to help with that. For a few bucks a month, if that's what you want to donate, you can help us. Thanks so much for spending a little bit of your day with me. Your support and the time you spend with me means more to me than I will ever be able to tell you. Stay safe, my friends, and be kind to each other. And I'll see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.